In a recent campaign, I conquered the world as a complete beginner, and in this video, I'm going to share with you everything I learned from this experience. It's a long video, so I recommend using timestamps to jump around. Let's get right into it. When you first start out, all the rulers in the game are randomized as far as their stats. So for example, this guy will always be 24 years old. He'll always look like this. These personality traits are going to be different. So if you don't get a good roll, you can go back and just it takes like three or four seconds to reload a new game. So in this case, not bad, actually. I would probably roll with this, especially that he's got a virtuous trait that's going to give piety, which you can use to do a lot of early wars. So I wouldn't have to reroll, but let me reroll this once and just see what we get. There we go. So this time we got some pretty bad stuff. Callus. Actually, I wouldn't say bad. Just probably not what I'd be looking for. Intrigue isn't all that useful. So yeah, this I would probably reroll. So like I said, just keep in mind there is some RNG with this. Maybe take a few minutes. Make sure you get a decent start. Let's talk about lifestyle for a second. Now, when you're first starting out, I generally like to start my first ruler's life on Marshall for a couple reasons. Bedlam Justice is really, really good to have as the first perk. So the CB cost minus 50%. If you run out of prestige or piety, you're not going to be declaring any wars and you're just going to be sitting there twiddling your thumbs. So very important to make sure you have enough of these resources to be able to keep the wars going smoothly. I generally take authority focus for the plus 0.3 control, and then I'll usually pick up serve the crown as the second perk to get the other 0.3. So really, really nice to have at least these two things. And then while you're still increasing control, maybe stay in Marshall for a little bit. And then once your control gets up on the last territory you plan on keeping for a while, you can switch out of this. But a good way to focus, I generally like to go down either gallant. R really, the important ones are right here. Knight effectiveness plus 75%. The plus five combat advantage is pretty nice. And then the plus four knights is huge. So these four are really strong. If you need to stay in this tree a little bit longer, I generally don't go all the way down in Marshall. It's just not all that useful, but picking up these two first and then maybe down this tree, or if you have a lot of men at arms, you can definitely go down the middle hit and run. Gives you a lot of good bonuses as well. Now let's talk about maybe for your second life or once you get these and you want to have a little bit better economy, I would generally switch over to stewardship next at some point. This is for the early stage of your campaign, maybe your first like five or six rulers. You're going to want to make sure you have enough domain limit. So by going domain focus, it gives you plus three stewardship. Now your steward skill for every six that you have, every six points, you get plus one domain limit. So essentially domain focus gives you half of a domain limit. This gives you a plus two. So just going down here and getting eight perks, you're going to get two and a half increased domain limit. And then we'll talk in a little bit about your spouse. Your spouse can help help make up the difference. And you can go from only being able to hold four or five all the way up to, you know, nine, ten, something like that in the early game, which is going to give you a huge boost. A lot of these other perks aren't really that important. There's some in here that are decent, like decreasing construction cost. Architect's pretty nice if you plan on spending a lot of money. But again, we're talking about just the basic stuff. Having these two are going to go a long way. And then finally, I generally spend the majority of my game in the learning tree. Now, I generally go plus three learning, the scholarship focus, and I always pick up scientific pretty much no matter what. This is like a no brainer. This increases your research speed, your cultural innovations. This is what governs that speed. So plus 20 percent there. If you're having trouble with succession because you're having too many kids, I will generally hold off on getting married until I can go down to restraint. And then I'll pop off one or two kids until I get one that actually works. And then I will pick up restraint, go celibate, and then I can go wild on everything else. A couple other things here, and we'll talk about this a little bit later, but just to touch on it, apostate is really, really important when you're going from a Christian faith to a non-Christian faith or, you know, from one faith group to another because the cost is like 10 or 15,000 piety. It's insane. So you want to definitely pick up apostate before you convert. In this campaign, I think I was able to go from Catholic to Asatru for like 2,200 piety because of this, minus 75%. So then once you have your religion ready to go and you want to reform it, you want to pick up profit right here. Faith creation and reformation cost minus 50%. So again, it's going to save you a ton of piety and allow you to do it much sooner than you'd normally be able to. So Learning is really, really important. There's also a bunch of other ones if you want to speed up your research. Obviously, this one helps a lot with the cultural fascination progress, but anything that gives you learning is a huge boost. So level of devotion is not hard to get with the build that, that we have. So level of devotion, you're going to get like a plus eight to plus 10 just by having this one thing, which really makes a big difference in increasing your learning rate. You know, coming down here, picking up another plus five. There's a lot of things in here that can help you out a lot. 
If you're getting kind of old and you need maybe another 10 years to live so that you can spend your prestige before you lose it all when you die, one thing that I also like to do is come up here and take whole of body. So you come down this right side, you get reduction from illness. So illnesses aren't as bad. You get disease resistance. Down here, if you make it all the way here, you get medium health boost. You can switch medicine focus to, to get a small health boost here. And then again, whole of body, you get another medium boost. So taking these three things will give you a massive boost. Like you can live, I think I had my oldest guy in his 90s. So pretty crazy if you do that. Again, I don't really like to extend a ruler's life unless there's a reason to do it. You generally want to have your heir take over when they're 16, as close to 16 as possible so that they can have a nice long reign. If you have somebody that's, you know, 80 or 90, yeah, you can get a little bit more done, but then you're going to have a kid that takes over that's 60, and then they're only going to have five or 10 years to rule, and then they're going to turn it over again. Turnover is the biggest killer. So again, having these is a big help. Now, there are some instances where you'd want to take something from intrigue or maybe even diplomacy. I didn't really use it as much for this campaign just because everything that I needed was in these three. So again, these are really good trees as well. Just didn't really fit in with the build that I was going for. These two are really good if you can take advantage of these perks. But again, like I said, I didn't really have a need for it. So I mostly stuck to these three, especially learning. Now let's talk about dealing with strong enemies. So in this case, we want to attack somebody to get one piece of land, but they've got a strong ally. Now alliances in CK3 are set between people, not the land that they control. So if you eliminate the person at the top, you actually eliminate the alliance. So for example, this guy's got one ally. If we kill him, the alliance ends. Only a 30% chance to succeed, but if we look at his buddy that he's allied to, it's a 41% chance. Not a huge in increase, but you know, it's better than nothing. So we definitely want to try and eliminate this guy. And once he's assassinated, that alliance is gone. We can easily attack the main guy. This also works for truces. So if you just attack somebody that's really old, you win the war, take a bunch of land. Normally you'd have to wait five years before you can attack him again. You can turn around and declare war as soon as the guy dies, because the truce is between the people, not between the land that they own. Or you can try and assassinate him. So you want to make sure the assassination ends right after you take the first chunk of land, because once you kill him, that truce is gone. You can attack him right away again. Another important thing to talk about is when you're expanding, you want to try and limit how many neighbors you have for the land that you're taking. So for example, in this case, Leon was only bordered by Brittany when I first took it. Obviously, West Francia has expanded. So now we've got two neighbors. Not that big of a deal, but let's say I wanted to take Al Maziti. This would be a pretty bad target to take because it's only a small chunk of land. It's not very valuable and it's surrounded by one of the strongest kingdoms or empires in the game. These guys are really, really strong. They've got a strong alliance network, 15,000. Basically, they match our numbers. So if we were to take this land and at some point we had to fight off rebellions or we were fighting an offensive war and we lost a bunch of troops, 100% these guys would try and dogpile in, declare war, and then you'd have to fight on two fronts against you know, somebody that's got the same or or greater numbers than you. So just be aware of that. Another important factor is to play very defensively when you're fighting against strong enemies. Try and be patient. Let them attrition themselves out because when they start to attrition, when they lose their supply, they actually have a debuff on their battle rolls, which means they take more casualties than you. So if you're outnumbered, they have a stronger army, you can still defeat them without having to do anything too fancy other than just letting them starve. And then when you attack, you get a bonus to your rolls, they get a debuff to their rolls, and it's it's a pretty big difference. The only thing I would say is keep an eye on your war score, because if you're too passive and they control the war goal, you will end up losing the war just by default. So if the war score starts to tick closer to 100%, you got to go in. But if you if it's at like minus 40, minus 50, don't worry about it. Stay calm. Look for those good fights when they're attritioned. Take a good defensive battle or one where you're heavily in favor and then go for it. Another thing that's important to keep in mind when you're expanding, you have to be aware of what religion you're expanding into. So there's two reasons this is important. Number one, if you pick on a big religious group, they will band together and declare a holy war on you if they are an organized religion. So for example, Catholics, I was taking a lot of Catholic lands and I think I had to fight off, if I recall, it was 10 or 12 crusades, somewhere in that range. It was an absurd amount of crusades. It was one right after another. So if you take a bunch of land from these guys, they're going to hate you. If you take a little bit and then you go take a little bit from the Muslims, you take a little bit from Africa, from Asia, and you kind of spread it out a little bit, it actually doesn't piss too many people off and they shouldn't be declaring holy wars on you as frequently. But if you go gangbusters on these guys, they see you as a huge threat. Also, every time you declare a war on a different religion and you take land, it increases their fervor. And when the fervor gets to a certain point, they're able to declare a holy war. If their fervor is below the threshold, 
they can't declare the Holy War. So that's why if you take a little bit and let it cool off, it can kind of extend that peace period that you have to, to kind of do your thing. The other reason this is important is as you take land, you get rebels based on different stats. So for example, if we look right here, this is my original starting country. These people should be happy. Uh, we just changed religion, so they're not too happy about that. And they don't like the offensive war. If we go to something else, like over here, something that was a little bit more recently conquered, you can see fervor is still an issue, cultural acceptance is an issue. So these two things are going to be big. So if, for example, in lands that we've owned for, that I've owned for a very long time, if I didn't convert religion, this wouldn't be here. But you would only get rebels if you have a bunch of wars. Whereas over here, you're just naturally going to get a bunch of people pissed off because you took land from them. Also, with the control is is a pretty big issue, negative control. So anytime you take land recently you're going to have zero control there. So like if I come down here to something that was a little bit more recently conquered, this is 23 out of 100. So their control is really low and you're going to get a, a pretty big debuff from that. Anytime you get multiple people trying to rebel that are pissed off at you, whether that's religious, whether it's low control, they're all going to group into certain buckets. So for example, in this one, these are actual vassals that you have to worry about, but we're talking about just the populace. So in this case, Marrakesh, Tadla, and Fazaz. Yeah, so you can see in this case, this is a cultural rebellion. So if I take too many lands in a culture that's similar, they're going to increase a lot. So right now it's too small. They're not going to rebel. If I were to take more lands in this area, you would have more and more people here stacking up. This power bar would go up. And once it crosses, crosses that threshold, they can rebel. If I were to instead go take land out here in Asia, they have nothing in common culturally or religion wise. You would have a bunch of smaller ones that aren't able to band together. Same thing right here. Catholic populists. And these are Norse. Catholic populace, but any of the Catholic populace will start to band together here. So you can see Cumberland, Geneva, basically all these people in this area that, that are Catholic and we took land from them. They do not like us. Spread your conquests out so that you don't have a bunch of one thing at a time or do everything in one area and just deal with the rebellions all in one location rather than having to if so, for example, if I were to take a lot of land here from West Francia and then I were to take a bunch of land up here in Sweden, these are both Catholic nations. Their rebellion is going to spawn here and here at the same time. You're going to have to jump back and forth and it's a real pain in the neck. So what I recommend is only conquer enough to avoid a rebellion in a certain area and then spread it out or go really hard, really fast in one area and just bite the bullet, deal with a rebellion when it pops up. That's what I would recommend in that case. And then finally, sometimes surrendering is actually the best option if you get hit with a really tough war. So there were two instances where I lost wars. One was because I didn't get there in time. I was fighting off a crusade in Europe and the Muslims had attacked for this chunk of land down here in Alba and I wasn't able to get there in time to defend. So they actually won the war. I, I didn't even contest it at all. The other instance, there was a really big rebellion. It was about 350% of my current power score. So this, this bar was 350% of what my power was and fighting that war was pretty much unwinnable. And all they wanted is they wanted to lower the the tribal authority from, I think it was two down to one. So I just let them have it. I conceded it. I gave up a little bit of prestige. I think I might have given up a level of fame or something like that. It wasn't really that big of a deal. And within a couple months, I actually just passed tribal authority to get it back up there anyways. So it, it's really not a big deal. Try and pick and choose your battles wisely. If it's something easy to give up, like if some huge country is attacking you for one county, who cares? Let it go. You can declare war later and just take back an entire kingdom instead of just fighting for that single county. And in this case, if somebody's rebelling and they just want to have your authority lowered, just give it to them. If you're already preoccupied, don't worry about it. It's really not that big of a deal. Now, I know I touched on rebellions already in the other section, but I wanted to cover a couple more things that I think I might have missed here. So when you fight rebellions here, we mentioned the power level. So these guys have 150% of my current strength. So if this rebellion pops off, it's going to be bad news. They've got a little bit stronger. It's still doable. But the problem is there's other rebellions that are about to go off as well. This is a huge uprising. And they're going to have just about equal numbers. And then if you look further down here, there's a couple others that aren't quite there yet, but they're not too far off. So for example, this one's 40%. It only needs 70% to get there. So 30% more and they'll get there. There's a bunch more here just waiting to go. And this one, again, another 254% just waiting to go. One thing you have to be aware of, this is a snapshot in time. So as of right now, exactly 89,000 troops is what they're basing all of this off of. Once these other rebellions start and you start fighting these big battles, and let's say you lose five, 10,000 people at a time, you're going to get attrition down. That means that all these other people that are currently not 
in range of going into rebellion will very quickly become rebellion issues because your force is going to go from, like I said, 90, maybe they go down to like 70 or 60,000 troops. Now they're in range, they're going to pop off. You're going to have to fight them, lose more troops. Then this one's going to fire off. This one's going to fire off because it gets lower. This It's kind of like a death spiral. So you have to be really, really cautious when you start stacking up these things. And then it also means that people on the outside that have a pretty good army are starting to look at you like your chopped liver. So this guy's got 35,000 troops, 60,000 with his alliances. If we were to, say, lose troops and we're fighting against three different rebellions, they take all that into consideration and they, they look at the balance of power as a total. So you could very well find yourself in another war, even though you could easily fight this guy off 1v1, but he knows you're tied up in three or four other wars and a lot of your manpower is going to come out. So you have to be really cautious with that. Don't always look at where you're at right now. Try and look ahead maybe one or two years and say, okay, after this war is done, how much manpower am I going to expend by doing this? And if that happens, how many of these other rebellions are going to you know, fire off because of it? And what other risks are you open up to? So are you bordering somebody that has claims on you? Like this guy, we're boarding them. They could easily attack us at any time. The Byzantine Empire could attack us at any time. Isfahan could attack at any time. These are big nations. They, they all look at that at all times. So you got to be really cautious with that. Now let's talk about dealing with vassals. So we're going to very quickly win this war, take this land real quick. Now, if you've never played with Bombards yet, this is going to be eye-opening. Look how fast the siege is. It's literally over the instant I touched this, touched the fort. All right, there we go. War's done. So it can be confusing if you own a lot of land. So, for example, all this land around here is owned within my realm, but that doesn't mean we personally hold on to it. If you zoom in, notice how these have the blue tags right here. This means that is personally in your name. And if I scroll over here, this still has the red border. That means it's in your realm, but somebody else owns it. So that's one of your vassals. That's how you can really quickly tell what land is yours without having to go to your, your list of fiefs and right click on it to have it. It's just a, just a mess. So just zoom in a little bit. Look for the blue tags. Everything in blue tag that's yours that you personally hold and you need to get rid of. So for example, 19 out of 10, that's not going to work. So what I usually do is I start at the highest level first. I go kingdom first. So we know we we conquered land in a kingdom war. So we should be able to yank this title. So we go to the cling, the kingdom titles tab. Uh, when you're first starting out, you can maybe go here to the titles screen and start doing it here. But if you look, there's so many titles that I didn't do because I messed up in the beginning. I didn't want to go back and redo it. So personally, I find it easier just to do it from this tab. So kingdom titles, create the title. Then we're going to go down another layer, which is duchy. That's the next layer. There's three duchies here. So we need to go one by one. And if you want to do it really fast, you just click on Click on the flag and enter twice. Very fast. So now we have the kingdom, we have the three duchies, and now we get to give out the individual counties. So what I like to do is I like to grant these to somebody within our realm. We are going to add some filters here. So if you go to, in the bottom left, grant to this little magnifying thing for the filters, and you come up here and type in content, we're going to click on content. You can add loyal if you want. Loyal is a bit more rare, so you may get a reduced selection of people here. You can also get something like lazy. Lazy is really nice to have. So having three, you're going to have very few people that have all three traits. It's pretty rare. So usually just two out of the three are pretty good. You know, lazy, content, loyal, honest is really good as well. Nobody is going to have all four. That's pretty rare. So I usually get rid of loyal. That one's kind of the hardest one to find. And then maybe something like honest is not that big of a deal. Lazy and content is kind of my favorite. So we're going to pick the top guy. It doesn't really matter that much who you pick because they're not going to survive that long anyways. You know, 10, 20 years and they're going to pass it on to somebody else. So the stats that you see right here are only good for a few years. If you really want to min-max it, you want to find somebody with good stewardship because they're going to be able to manage more domain themselves and pass it off. So there's two schools of thought here. If you're feeling lazy, just give everything to one person and they will sort it all out themselves. So for example, let's say we wanted to give everything to this guy. So we can go through and click it right here and you can see all those lands are, are uh, given to him. And if you scroll down, you'll see where they are in here, but you have to also give away the higher titles. So you notice these are grouped up counties and then one higher is going to be the duchy. So you want to also give away the duchy. So all these are in that duchy. You also want to give him this duchy, give him this duchy. And then we want to give him the kingdom so that he can manage all of this himself. We don't want to deal with any of the management. So if we click grant title, he's going to have all of that. He probably doesn't have enough to hold it. He's got nine stewardship. So he's going to have enough to hold maybe four titles himself. And we're giving, giving him what, nine or ten titles. 
So that's probably not going to work. The other way you can do it is give them out by the duchy. So in this instance, we're just going to give him the first one, scroll down, find out what duchy that's under. So it's going to be this duchy. And then all the counties within that duchy are going to be right underneath it. So we click the duchy. We double, we keep clicking all the ones underneath that. And then we stop. We don't want to give him anything else. Just one duchy at a time. So let's actually go through with that one. We're going to give away to the next person. And again, we're going to go down and we're going to find there's only three counties in this duchy. So we'll give him all of these. And then we're going to give the last one away to somebody else. So all this, so two plus the one county, everything's there. Now, the problem with this is now we have three vassals. And if you're in the late game and you have a ton of vassals, you're not, there's no way you're going to have enough room for them. So for example, right here, we're actually over our vassal limit, 103 out of 102. Every one vassal that you go over your limit, you lose 5%. And it's, if you look to the left, the vassal levies and vassal taxes is minus 5% for every one vassal you, you go over. So if you have 10 vassals over, you're getting half levies, half taxes from your vassals. Very, very important because keep in mind, you may not need all those troops to actually fight a battle, but they help deter rebellions and they help deter the enemy from attacking you. So if you go way over your vassal limit, it may not make a difference for you in the wars that you're conducting, but it will make a huge, huge, huge difference when it comes to fending off rebellions or getting attacked by crusades or jihads or whatever, people trying to take your land. So don't underestimate how powerful it can be to stay at or under your vassal limit. So in this instance, we have three vassals for this one action that we did. So what we're gonna do is actually give these away. One of these people needs to have the kingdom title. Now, what I like to do is I like to give the kingdom title to whoever's gonna be the strongest so he can keep these other two vassals in check. So this guy got four duchies. Most likely this is gonna be the strongest out of the three. So what I'll do is I'll actually go in here and give it to him. So we know that he owns this land, so we just wanna right click on his portrait, grant titles, and then we're going to scroll all the way down till we see the kingdoms. If you're not sure which kingdom it is, you can just use your mouse to mouse over these little flags and it'll tell you what they are. Now, we obviously don't want to give away our empire. We want to give away only the kingdom. Now, it's not this one, not the kingdom Zungaria, but Outer Ajuran. So if you mouse over, you can see it highlights it. So that's how I know this is the right kingdom title. So click on that. We give it to him. Now, one thing that's nice is because we because we gave away the kingdom title after the fact, the vassals actually transfer over automatically to him. So if we go over to our vassal tab, instead of being at 103, we're now down to 101. We're one under, which is perfect. We had three vassals. We gave two of them away to this one guy. So now we're only managing this guy and he is managing these other two. So very important to stay under your vassal limit. Going over a little bit, not that big of a deal. You definitely don't want to go too far over. So just keep an eye on that. Now, one thing that can happen if you give away the kingdom title and then you give away the duchy titles later, these vassals that you give away as a duchy will actually be your vassals. So what you need to do is you need to either give them away up here. It'll have a little pop up where you can click on it and give the vassals to him. Or you can right click, click grant vassal, and you can start giving away vassals. Now, we looked at people that were content and lazy and honest. But if you don't have any, it's not the end of the world. But one thing you do have to be aware of is there are certain ones you definitely do not want to give land away to. Oh, another uh, trusting is actually another really good one to have as well. So trusting and honest, this guy would actually make a pretty good vassal. But if we scroll down here, this lady would not be a good vassal at all. She's ambitious. That is a big one. They are going to want to take more land. They're going to want to break away from you. They won't want to be your vassal. So that's a pretty bad one to have. Generally avoid giving people that are ambitious. Some other examples are like dishonest or greedy. You generally want to stay away from those as well. But if you were to find somebody that's just kind of neutral, like this guy, Craven's not that big of a deal, impatient, deceitful, not the end of the world. I would probably not be too upset about giving this guy land if that was our only option. Another thing that's going to help you big time when managing your vassals is having lots of perks that add opinion. So powerful vassal opinion is pretty important. Most of the vassals that you're going to have are going to be powerful if you're doing a world conquest because you're basically just only giving away kingdoms. You're not having anybody else and anybody that has their own kingdom is going to be considered a powerful vassal just by based on how much land they own. Plus five vassal is not that big of a deal. But again, if you have 10 of these, now it's a big deal because you, you're stacking it up. So there's some legacies in here that are pretty good. Another thing that could be very beneficial to you is giving away land to your family members. If you have a lot of plus 
relations with family members so like close family plus 10 dynasty opinion plus five there's a lot of dynasty members in this campaign that i have given land away to so this plus five has helped quite a bit there's other things like this cultural tradition loyal subjects this adds plus 10 percent opinion of liege and this only works if they are of the same culture that i am and i only gave land to people of the same culture the only people that are va my vassals that i've personally assigned as a vassal are going to be this culture we're going to get a plus five there really really important there's also other things like this tradition adds the loyal trait as being more common in the empire makes it a lot easier to find people to give land away to they're also less likely to join factions so that's pretty nice to have I also reformed the Asatru, and I'm going to cover this in more detail later, but again, stacking all these relations modifiers when you can. So I only made vassals that were the same culture and the same religion as me. So 100% going to get a plus 10 every time. So if we add those three things that I just talked about, that's plus 20. That is huge. Then if we come over here to the Chancellor, you can switch them all to domestic affairs. We're going to pick up another plus 15 right here. So now we're talking about plus 35 right off the rip with nothing else. Then as you get older, you get, you know, long reign benefits. If you're of high fame level, you get a relations boost there. I think you get another one for higher piety. So you can really stack up the relations boost. Towards the end game, even with a brand new ruler, you're still going to be stuck at 100 relations. Like all these guys are 100. Everybody's at 100. Nobody hates us. Yeah, so there, there's just a lot of ways to do it. I highly recommend stacking as many of these modifiers as you can. Some of them aren't going to be as relevant. Like, for example, Religious Icon and Living Legend are really good, but they're only going to be when you're old enough to have that level. If you die and your heir takes over, they're not going to have this, right? So you're going to be at a 60 deficit. So you want to make sure you have these other ones that are going to be working no matter what. So the Vassal, Virtuous, Blood Divine, that's also another important one. So once you form your own religion and you do a few other things, you can get divine blood. This is another plus five to same faith. And again, we're only having same faith people in the kingdom. And then the final way to do it, I, I don't really recommend doing this in the late game. You, you're going to have too many people to do it. But in the early game, this is really important to do is to sway. So right click anybody that has bad relations. You can sway them and that'll boost their relations by 25 every you know year, year and a half, something like that. So pretty powerful there. And if you're money bags, you can give gold away. Honestly, I think in the 55 hour campaign, I must have done this maybe 10 times at most. And it's usually when I was trying to convert people to a different religion, I just needed a real quick hit of relations. I almost never use this. Mostly it's just swaying and having a good build. Now, one of the first things I do when I get into any campaign is I try and look around and see who that I can hybridize with culture wise. It's very important to hybridize if there's a benefit to it. So, for example, starting out as an Irish noble, you're going to be really behind the times in terms of research. So if we click on this button right down here, the cultures tab, you can see everybody around you that's got different culture. You can see what hybridizing looks like. If they're of a similar background to yours, you cannot hybridize with them. So Gaelic is very similar to Irish. It won't let you do it. Pictish will let you do it. And if we click down here, it says form hybrid culture. You can get an idea of what you'll get out of it. So we can pick up only a single research. So probably not worth it. Can check out a couple of the ones. This culture's got two. I really, for the Irish start, I really like to look at Breton because you pick up four right from the rip. And each of these would take anywhere from 50 to 60 years each unless you've got you know a genius that's got really good learning but basically by hybridizing you're going to pick up so many free innovations it's going to really put you ahead of everybody else around you the other reason you'd want to hybridize is so you can switch certain things so like for example the ethos i think there's eight or nine to choose from but you only get to pick one of two if you're hybridizing so in this case ceremonious communal these are okay they're not great but they're also not terrible you could switch it later as well. Really, the important one is the traditions. There's a lot of good traditions in here that would help you in the meantime. I usually like to unclick them all and just kind of go through and see which ones I want. But realistically, I usually end up leaving some of these blank so that I can reform them later. So for example, if I were to pick these four, but I can pick up to five, that means four will be active and there's going to be a blank spot, which means you won't get any of these bonuses. You'll be short that but the reason that's nice is because if I were to, say, diverge my culture, let's say if I wanted to change one of these, these are super expensive. So if you look right here, 5,000 prestige is, is really a lot. So for example, if I wanted to reform here, we see that if I want to switch one of these, it's going to cost me 7,500 prestige to switch to agrarian. 
If I were to do the same thing here with establishing a new one, it's only 5,000. It's a pretty big difference. Some of the bonuses are not all that great, to be honest, and I'd rather have a 2,000 prestige discount just waiting for me. You don't want to have too many blank, though, because it's 50 years between each time that you can add or reform one of these. And also, every time you go up a tech, you have to add another one. So that means you're waiting 50 years every time this happens. So here's right here, just going from one, two, three, four. That's three. That's 150 years of waiting right here. And if you reform one of these, that's 200 years. If you were to do them back to back perfectly. Now, obviously, if we had all blanks, you, you'd be waiting to the end of the game to get these filled in. So only leave maybe one Maybe at most leave two blank, but I, I probably would just stick with one and then pick four of the, the other ones that you want to keep with. If you're not sure what the cost of a bonus is, you can hover your mouse over it and it'll tell you why it's more expensive or why it's not. So for example, this culture doesn't have bellicose, stoic, or bureaucratic for the ethos. It's actually ceremonious right now. If we wanted to pick up castle keepers and we had either of these, it would actually be only 5,000 instead of 7,000. Also, if the culture had battlements innovation, it would be even cheaper, so 3,000. But obviously, we're, we don't have battlements. It's all the way over here in early medieval. We're a long ways away from it. So basically, you just have to save up a little bit more prestige to be able to get it. So what I generally like to do is at the very beginning of a campaign, I like to kind of go through and pick out which ones I want. And then I'll figure out what I need to have in order to get them cheaper. So for example, if I wanted to pick up longbow competition, this is definitely one that I picked up in this campaign. If you look right here, you need to have stoic or bureaucratic ethos it's really hard to switch your ethos i'm not going to lie i didn't switch mine until close to the end because it costs like twenty thousand prestige actually let's look it costs twenty thousand prestige i mean you're not going to have that until you're just balling out of control where it doesn't even matter anymore but in the early game that's probably not going to happen so you can pretty much ignore that but if we wanted to check out the other one if we wanted to save three thousand prestige which is a big chunk all we needed to do was have 1200 men at arms archers so that means we come over here, we make sure we have 1,200 archers, which right now we don't. We have only 500. So we could hire another group of archers here. We could fire these light footmen and hire more archers and make sure that we have enough. And that means we only need 4,000 prestige instead of 7,000 to get this thing passed. And again, if we had, if we were trying to replace something, it would be even more. So this is exactly why I leave one blank and then I try and go through and pick exactly which ones I want. So because this is replacing an existing tradition, it adds 50%, 3,500. So 10,500, that's, that's just not going to happen. That's like, you'd have to save up an entire lifetime in the early game, and even then you might not even get it. Try and plan it out a little bit better here. So we leave one blank, we pick up that. If we have 1,200 men at arms, makes it cheaper. 4,000 prestige, that's doable very easily. A couple hunts, a few raids, and you got it. So some of the most important traditions here, I, I already covered Longbow, that one's really good if you can get access to it. Really, for this campaign to go smoothly, by the sword is really, really important. By picking this up, there's no limitation to the number of kingdom level holy wars that you can declare. So that means you can do back to back kingdom wars in one lifetime. I think at the most, I probably did like 10 or 15 in one lifetime. And it was it was a significant amount of land with one person. It actually might have been higher than that now that I think about it. It also means that your specific level of devotion needs to be one level less. So for example, right now we're at Faithful. You need to be Devout Servant to be able to, or you need to be Paragon of Virtue to be able to declare a Holy War for Kingdom. But with this perk, it actually reduces, you only need Devoted Servant. So it's a lot less. You can do it a lot sooner. Really, really nice to have that. There's a couple other things. It reduces your piety gain and different faith opinion. These are kind of irrelevant. It is rough having the, the minus diplomacy, but you do pick up Marshall for it. So there's some pluses and minuses, but honestly, this is irrelevant. The biggest thing is this right here, the Holy War. And also because we paired it with Asatru and we kept Blot, we didn't reform out of Blot, we kept this. We can execute people for as much piety as we want. So anytime we get a new ruler, so for example, right now we've got a new guy, Heidi's really low, I can easily just execute everybody. So max execution, that takes us all the way up to 1200. It's not quite enough to go over the, the limit, but further in the campaign, usually I'm sitting on 50 to 100 prisoners, and you can instantly go from like the lowest level up to Paragon of Virtue, and you'll have four or 5,000 piety or more. So that means you can you can do back to back holy wars, you know, five or six of them, no problem. So pairing blot with by the sword is such a strong combo, really fun to use. The other thing before we move on, if you look down here, we'll talk about this in the religious part. But when you're doing religious wars, you have to keep in mind if your religion has pluralist active, when you win a holy war, you actually vassalize infidel rulers. 
rather than taking their lands. So that means if anybody has the opposite religion, you're actually going to get them as a vassal. They're going to hate you. They're going to be the wrong culture. They're going to be the wrong religion. You're going to have a nightmare dealing with, with vassals. It's super important before you start going gangbusters with these holy wars, make sure you have at least righteous or fundamentalist. What this means is that anytime you take land, if they're of the wrong religion as you, you immediately get all of their land. So if they had vassals, you no longer have vassals. It's all yours and you give it to the people that you want. And remember, we want to have high relations, which is why we only give land to people that are of the same culture, the same religion, with all those buffs that we had to the relations. You don't get any of that if you're pluralist because they're going to be the wrong culture and wrong religion. So again, make sure you reform your religion. Personally, I prefer fundamentalist. The reason is because you can revoke land if they're hostile or evil. And because we re reformed our religion of, of a very rare religion, like there's only a few people on the map that are Asa true in the beginning and they always convert out to Catholicism. So it's basically everybody in the world is hostile or evil. That means even if you get vassals somehow that aren't of your religion, you can just yank their land and then you can give it to somebody else that's going to be a good vassal. So really important. You'll have a debuff for anybody that's of a different religion, which isn't a problem because again, you're only dealing with people of your religion. It also speeds up the conversion speed. So that's kind of nice. And I know I spoke about it in another section, so I'm going to hit on this really fast. Another cultural tradition that I think is really important is loyal subjects. This is going to give you more people with good traits to give as vassals, so loyal traits important. They're less likely to join factions. They're going to get a plus 10 relations to you every time because, you're, again, we're only promoting the right people. So this is a really good one to have. Strength in numbers is another one of those ones where you might think, oh, this is bad. You lose knights and some other stuff. Really, for this campaign, I was going real heavy in the archers. So you pick up plus two archer regiments and the recruitment cost is a little less. That's not really that big of a deal. But getting a plus two if you're having only archers is huge. You know, by the end of the campaign, I had up to 42 people in one regiment. And just stacking all these little ones is how you do it. You know, you got to get all these. You get another plus two from the longbows. There's other buildings we'll go over soon that'll have all that. Really, really important. Another good tradition is legalistic for three big reasons. Number one, you're going to get more people with the just trait. These are really good vassals. So that'll be more common in your empire. Vassal limit plus 30. And if you're going to take over the whole world, you're definitely going to need something that increases your vassal limit. You need to get it up to like around 140, 150. Otherwise, you're going to be dealing with being over your vassal limit. And plus 30 is really, really big. The other thing is title creation costs. Now, in the late game, it's not a big deal. You're going to have more money than you can spend. But, you know, if you can get this early enough, that title creation cost makes a huge difference. There's something like 50 or 60 kingdoms and then each kingdom has i don't know three to five duchies in them so if you multiply that out by say an average cost of six or you know five, i think it's wait, maybe four 450 something like that times you know hundreds you're talking about hundreds of thousands of gold 30 percent savings on that is is a big difference so it does add up. It helps. And then one of my favorite ethoses is Bellicos. Mercenary who cares plus prowess is kind of nice to have, but really it's the men at arms maintenance minus 10%. That's really nice to have. The levy size is also really good. 10% is a big, it's a pretty big boost. In the late game, you're probably not going to be using levies, but again, having them in the bank is really good for keeping rebellions down. So even if you don't use them, it just helps keep you out of range of rebellions. Now let's talk about religion. So in the very beginning, we start off as Catholic, but pretty soon on switch over to Asathru. Now the reason I wanted to go with Asathru is because we're going to be using Holy Wars the vast majority of this campaign. And to be able to do a Holy War, you need to be of a different religion, be hostile or evil or whatever it is. So if you go Asathru, pretty much everybody on the map is going to be hostile to you. Now these guys up here in the Scandinavian region, they will pretty quickly turn to Catholicism. So at some point, even they will be able to be Holy Ward. So not a problem there. So when you're getting ready to convert, you want to switch over here to, to the learning lifestyle and you want to pick up apostate. It's only three perks in, so it's not that far. 75% conversion cost reduction is really, really big. Then later, when you want to reform your faith, you want to come down the theologian. It's four perks and you want to get to profit. This is going to reduce reformation cost by 50%. So if we look at it right now, we don't have a reformed faith. This is unreformed. We want to switch a bunch of things out here. So if we were to go through and fix all these things, it's going to cost us quite a bit. If we pick up that perk, it's going to reduce that by 50%. So pretty big difference. 
Now let's switch over to a different save so I can show you a couple things. Now let's go over the most important things here when I went to reform. So Warmonger and Blot are originally Asatru. I didn't change these. I felt like that was important to keep. Blot is really important because you can execute a bunch of people to pick up Piety. So if you look right here, we've only got 731 Piety, but we've got 148 prisoners. If we execute everybody, we just instantly picked up 10,000 piety. Now, just imagine if you, in this case, it's not a big deal because we already own the map, but we could easily do 20 or 30 back-to-back -back holy wars just with that piety alone. So really important to have blot. Make sure you keep that. Warmonger is really nice to have because it switches at war opinion to at peace opinion. And since you're going to be at war pretty much the whole game, being at peace is actually really hard to do. And so if you don't have Warmonger, you're gonna have a lot of rebellions in your own personal lands. So I really recommend keeping Warmonger. Communal identity is the one that I switched out. So I put this one in because it increases the conversion speed, but more importantly, it increases the same faith opinion by plus 10, makes it much easier to manage your vassals. Let's go over a couple of the more important changes down here. So I went from male dominated to equal. And the reason this is important is because if you have a bunch of kids, you might have a daughter that's really, really good, but they won't be the heir if you have a bunch of sons. So it's nice to be able to pick and choose which heir you want. The only downside is you have more heirs that you have to disinherit if you don't want that daughter to be in. But actually, more importantly, if you look at all the vassals that I have, the vast majority of these are actually female. It's crazy how many females are in here because they're just better. They have better stats. They generally have better personality traits. Some of my best champions are female. I mean, it's it's crazy. Look at this, 26. This lady's got 51. Having the option to pick both male or female for your champions, for your vassals, for your counselors, it's such a big difference. I can't, it, it, you might think, oh, this is a huge mistake because you do have to deal with more of a succession. But the amount of times that I found a really good female to lead an army or to be a good counselor or a vassal, vastly outweigh the amount of times I had to spend, you know, renowned disinheriting a, a girl or daughter. Really, it's not that big of a deal. So I recommend doing this. Also, one thing to keep in mind, if you look at the AI, they're going to have a bunch of daughters as well, and they have to split their lands up to their daughters. So it keeps your big vassals breaking up every time that they die due to succession. So it helps keep your vassals more manageable rather than it all going to one son. So that's another thing to keep in mind. And I know we talked about this earlier, but if you go fundamentalist, really easy to manage vassals. You can take land easy from people that don't belong. So if you get somebody in here, so for example, right now, if you look at the holy site right here, we've got two holy sites that actually are not working because they're not controlled by Asatru. These people, for whatever reason, are not of the right religion, and I can easily just throw her in jail. So 100% chance she accepts. I can negotiate her release and demand a conversion. And she likes me a lot more now. She was, what, minus 50 or minus 80 before. Now she's plus 30, even though we demanded conversion and we imprisoned her. So really nice to be able to do that. If we didn't have this main doctrine, we would not be able to do that. We'd have to fabricate a claim. We'd have to do something fancy to do it. In this case, if they don't have the right religion, we just kick them out. We, we grab them, we can execute them and put somebody else in there. Or in this case, we just demand conversion. So pretty nice to have. We can do the same thing. This guy doesn't match as well. We'll do it again. So he hates us even more. If we do demand conversion, he's going to ask for a bunch of crap. Yeah, we just imprison him. 74% chance. Demand conversion. And now he still hates us, but at least he's of the right religion, and we're getting that bonus again. So before, we were missing out on the piety and the heavy infantry damage. So don't sleep on this. Now, you, another thing, when you're in Holy Wars, I know I mentioned it before, but when you're in a Holy War, if you don't have the right main doctrine, you actually get vassals instead of getting the land yourself. So... Pluralist is a big, big no-no. Do not have Pluralist. At least have Righteous, but I recommend going Fundamentalist. This one is probably the easiest one to deal with. People will hate you more, but it makes it easier to kick those people out of your kingdom anyways. The next one is Lay Clergy. You can go Theocratic or Lay Clergy. Lay Clergy is nice because you get to hold your own Temple Holdings if you want. Vast majority of the time, I do not hold my Temple Holdings, but there are some instances where you want to keep them. So, for example, down here in Niani, there's a gold mine that is on the temple holding, not on the castle holding. So what I did is I actually switched to Lake Clergy and I took control of this temple. And then I actually gave this castle holding away to a vassal. 
So that means instead of boosting my holdings by two, now it's still only one. I just switched which one I hold because I'm able to hold all the temple holdings. Now, if you want to hold all your temple holdings and go wild with building them everywhere, go for it. But in this case, it just works out better that way. Another thing that's quite important, your head of faith, either none or temporal, when you're creating your own, you're going to most likely be in control anyway. So temporal is kind of nice because then you can you can be in control of doing those those really big, great holy wars if you ever wanted to do those. And then down here, a lot of the stuff is really not that important, to be honest. Divorce always allowed is pretty nice to have. These other things, not really that big of a deal. More importantly, down here, when you get to recruitment, I like to switch it to recruitment for a clerical function. These other ones are just not that good. This one's nice because you get plus four prowess, and a lot of your people are actually going to be a Sathru, which means your champions are going to have a pretty big boost. Clerical gender is either super important. If you're going to have a lot of females and you're, like I said before, we went equal up here. Same thing with your clerical gender. The more options you have, the more likely you are to get somebody that's got good stats. So really nice to have that. Clerical marriage, not that important. And then clerical appointment, temporal and revocable. This means that you can hire your own people and you can fire them whenever you want. So if you do temporal for life, that means if you get somebody in here that hates your guts... Like in this case, she actually doesn't, or he doesn't like us that much, even though everybody in the kingdom loves us. Hunter, everybody's hundreds, except for this one guy. So if if you get somebody that hates you, you can just fire him. So let's say this guy's only got 18 learning. We can find somebody, our vassal, that's 55 learning. That's insane. So we're going to put her in and do a much better job. If this position was for life, we would not be able to do that. And then the last thing, the holy sites for Asatru are actually pretty good. Uppsala is not that important. Prowess per level of devotion is really important because you're going to have a lot of people that are warriors that are Asatru in your kingdom. So getting plus one, some of them can have, you know, like a plus five or plus six prowess. Plus they're getting the 20% night effectiveness. That's really important. Stewardship for per level of devotion that just helps you have more holdings and all your vassals can have more holdings. So that means people that are trying to run your kingdoms will actually be more efficient in that case. Prowess per level of devotion again, so you get to double dip on this one. That one's really good. And then men of men at arms maintenance minus five percent. It's not a lot, but it all adds up. And you can see if you stack them really nicely, like we're paying, I think it's like 0.03 or less for, for all of our men at arms. It's they're basically free. Now, next, we're gonna talk about something that's actually really complicated. It took me a while to figure it out. I don't know if it's because I'm dense or it's just a kind of a, a poorly implemented mechanic, but going to your champions. There's a little spot up here. You can promote your champions to have certain accolades. These are super important though, because some of them were crucial for this build to work. So for example, I had the archer accolade and I had it maxed out at level six, which means all of our archer regiments had plus eight and the maintenance was minus 25% and their damage was 60% archer toughness, 30%. So really, really nice to have this. But it gets even better. You can double it up if you get the crossbow captain. You can get plus eight again to archers. So you're getting plus 16 from two accolades and the archer maintenance minus 25%. So minus 50% for all your archers just by having these two. Another 60% damage and 30% toughness. It's insane to have these two if you're going to do the archer spam. And remember, because we already reformed our culture, we have a lot of bonuses to archers, and we increased the size of those regiments by four already. So add that in. We're going to talk about building soon. It's going to buff it up even more. So these are really important. Another one that's really nice to have is Valiant. At the final bonus, you actually get a plus 30% to army damage. That means everybody, your archers, and if you're still using levies, they get the bonus damage as well. So just making your army basically unstoppable by stacking these bonuses. Stalwart's kind of nice to have. It's not as important, but at the top tier, you get plus 15% army toughness. Again, you're going to be stomping people pretty hard. You're probably not going to be taking a lot of damage, but it, you know, it's it adds to this to the bonus stack. So it's not bad to have. Now, there's another one in here that I should have gotten, but for whatever reason, it just skipped my mind. I did not get it, but this would have been really nice to have from early on. So Besieger, you need to have somebody that's level 8 prowess or higher. They need to be either a military engineer or a logistician. I use these guys all the time. Military engineers are really good commander traits, so not too hard to get a commander or a champion that has this trait. So promoting him with that accolade would be pretty nice. But at the top tier, it's going to give you plus four to your siege weapons. So right now you can see in the background, the bombards have 24 size. You can get that even higher if you get this accolade. 
It also reduces the, the siege phase time and daily siege progress. Essentially, this just means that even though forts and castles are falling fast, they're going to fall even faster with this accolade. Really important to have. And then finally, I actually should have talked about this first. If you're not sure what each accolade does or which ones or what, let's say if we wanted to find Archer, but we didn't have one available and you don't know what stats are needed, you just come in here, down here, you encyclopedia or you press F10, It'll open this up. You come up here to the accolades tab and then just type in what you're looking for. So archer, or let's say probably less known as the crossbow captain. So just crossbow and it'll pop up. You need somebody that's got eight prowess. They either need to have 20 experience in the bow hosta looter or the trait cautious leader. And you also need to have advanced bow making, which is, I believe, high medieval. Yeah, high medieval. It's a technology that you can research. So right here, it opens up the crossbow captain. But it's, it's really easy. It'll tell you exactly right here. So if you're not sure what anything is, you just come in here, type it in. The other way is to look it up on the wiki. But if you're alt-tabbing out, this game loves to crash when you alt-tab. I don't recommend it. Uh, I've tried to play in windowed mode too. It's still kind of a pain. So I usually just use the encyclopedia. It's really well done, actually. And then since we're here, let's go ahead and talk about keeping these accolades active. Because you're going to have people dying, they'll get old and die, or they'll die from battle. So pretty important to make sure these things stay up to date. You'll get a little pop-up right here in your current situation. It says you can appoint successors. I usually just come in here and do it manually, to be honest, because when you have five of them going at once, it's kind of hard to tell. You click on it, you'll see you got a blank successor. You'll usually have a lot of people to pick from. Just pick the top. The easiest way to do this, just look at the first couple letters. So we're looking for full carta and 20 pro S. We press escape to back out and we need to find them. So it was 20 pro S. So you just scroll down all the way down to 20. You can see I've got hundreds and hundreds of people to pick from here. So it's kind of a pain. But if you do it this way, it's really easy. You go down to 20 for carta. We force them into service. So they're going to be default but unallowed. So you force them in. You come back here and you're going to be able to plop them right in. So now when this guy dies, this guy takes over. And then we escape back out. This guy's got a successor. You can use escape and click so you can go through it really fast. So this guy's not going to have any access successors. This guy should. Yeah, so again, Lathir, 17 prowess. We go find somebody really easily. 17, Lathir, we force them and we pick them. Now, if you don't have anybody available, this option is going to be open where you can click Seek Worthy Accolade Successor. It's going to cost you, I think it's like 150 prestige. And Within a few months, you'll get somebody that actually qualifies. They may not be very good. A lot of times they give you dumpy ones like 8 or 10 prowess. But it's better to have a bad one than to have it go inactive. So just get anybody in there and then you'll be fine. Now, one thing that I think a lot of people gloss over, if you go into your court, you click this middle tab, the court grandeur. In the bottom left here, you see court type. There's six different court types that you can have. Now, if you're tribal, there's really only one court type you can have, and that's tribal court. And the bonuses are not bad. It actually helps you quite a bit with looting. So your raid speed and your loot capacity is increased by 20%, which is pretty good. Men at arm maintenance, if you get it up to level 10, minus 25%, that's pretty good. Once you switch over to feudal, you probably want to get out of tribal court as soon as you can. I generally like warlike court. Knight effectiveness is pretty good. Counter efficiency is okay. But really, this men at arms regiments plus one is super good. As you saw, we were stacking this number, and this is another way to get a plus one to each of your regiments. So that helps a lot. But just be aware, you have to have the right ethos. So the ethos determines what core types you're able to take. So right now, Ceremonious lets us pick between Diplomatic or Scholarly. Now, Diplomatic gives you a few things. Really, it's not that great. Mass, max Personal Schemes would probably be one nice to have if you get it up to 10, level 10 Court Grandeur, but really it's not that big of a deal. And then again, Scholarly, if you're trying to research stuff fast, having Learning Per Level of Fame is pretty nice, but I, I don't think this is all that good. So I spent a lot of time trying to get my Ethos over to Bellicose. Bellicose allows you to pick up Warlike, which again, all these, every single one of these is useful. So something to keep in mind. Now let's talk real quick about government types. So there's three different government types, tribal, feudal, and there's also clan. Usually it's down here uh, in the, the Muslim territory. They're mostly clan. Tribal and clan, are, my understanding is they're kind of similar. I've actually never played with clan before, so I don't know as much about it. But I, I've played a lot with feudal and tribal. So starting out in tribal is actually really nice because you can hire people using only prestige and you get to save all your money. 
And the good thing about that is you can convert your money very easily into prestige. So it's really easy to do that. You can go on hunts. That'll help you. You can go on pilgrimages if you need to boost piety. So you basically save a lot of money because your expenses are, are very close to zero. Another thing that's nice about being tribal is you can attack pretty much anybody on the map that you have range with. So if you zoom out and you click on somebody, it'll tell you if it's too far to interact with. If you can interact with them, you can declare war on them. So the reason I was able to expand from one side of the map to the other without having a big empire or having a lot of, of troops is I basically just hopscotched. So like this person has got 900 troops right now. I, I picked the save where I, you know, we have no troops, but let's say fast forward 50 years and I've got 3000 troops. We could easily take this guy out. And then from here, we could hopscotch again to maybe one of these solo ones like Muskia. That's an easy one. They've got 700 troops. Then you could hopscotch again and take Yarkal Kali. Then you could hopscotch again and come over here. And within, you know, maybe 10 years, you could literally be from one side of the map to the other side. And because you're tribal, you can go out and raid people. So if you put your marker down and you raise local raiders, now I can go take money from everybody. You can raid people, take money and get prestige each time that you raid. Now, again, because you hopscotched across the map, you've got so many more targets that you can, you can, you know, acquire. There's a certain cooldown between each raids, but more importantly, if they get raided recently, it takes time for their their money to build up. So, for example, if I look here in Wessex, these guy, this one's probably been raided recently. So they've only got four uh, gold in their in their bank account. But if we look around, we can find some people that haven't been raided for quite a while. Like this guy's got 21 gold. If you get lucky, you can get some that are up upwards of 50. I've seen I think upwards of 100 on some of the big sites, like over here, Bishopric of Canterbury. This one sometimes has a ton of cash on them. So, you know, look for those easy targets. And if you spread out all over the map, you can easily raid to your heart's content, switch targets, and just become fabulously wealthy with infinite targets to, to go after. Now, when you're ready to go feudal, what you need to do is you need to go all the way up here to tribal authority. Each time you go up, it costs you a certain amount of prestige and there's a cooldown. So like, for example, if we go limited tribal authority, we can't do the next one, even though we have enough prestige because we have to wait. There's a cooldown of 10 years. So to go from here to the fourth one, it takes 30 years. So you probably want to do this somewhat early so that when you're ready to go feudal, you're ready to go. Maybe sit at three. Don't go to four because you get really big uh, minus opinion debuffs. Maybe sit at three. And then when you're ready to go, you jump to four and do feudal immediately. And then you don't have to sit there. Now, to be able to go feudal, you need to have a couple things. You have to have, like I said, that fourth level of tribal authority we just went over. You need to have an organized faith. Now, right now, I'm part of Insular, which is already organized. But if you switch over to Asatru, they're actually unorganized. So which you, and it, we kind of already went over this in the religious tab, but you have to convert faith and then you have to do it again where you have to reform it. And that's where we switched all these things out. So once you reform your faith, that ticks off that thing. Then you need development in your capital of at least 10. That's not too hard to do. And then 70% of all military and civic tribal era innovations. Now, if you follow this guide and you did what I did on the cultural tab and you hybridize, just getting these four right off the bat, I think you need maybe one more and you've got it. it you, you can literally go feudal like right off the bat. It's it's crazy just because you're picking up these four innovations right away. Now, I recommend not going feudal too soon because what happens is there's a lot of things that change like with your income, your prestige use, the amount of levies that you get from your vassals, their attitude towards you does change as well. But there's a lot of things that change when you go feudal. And if you do it when you're too weak, it's not going to end well. So expand, do a lot of raiding, save up a lot of money. So if you can see right now, we're ready to go feudal. But I spent a lot of time expanding all over the place. So I took land down here in Africa, North Africa, Italy, we took out the Pope. We took back holy sites. We expanded out to Central Asia, East Asia, North India. So a lot of raiding was going on here all over the place. Saved up a lot of money. You can see right here we've got 20000 in the bank. Now, you might think 20000 there's no way you can spend all that. But believe me, after you know 50 years or less, you're going to blow through every penny of it it's all going to be gone. So if you can save up even more than that, more power to you. Let's go ahead and adopt feudal ways. I'll show you exactly what we need. So if you come over here, the only thing we're missing is absolute tribal authority. So we're sitting on three. All we need to do is click up and now we can go feudal ways. Keep an eye on one thing. If you look right here in the vassals tab, we're making 22 and we have 5,600 levies just in ourselves. We're getting 23 from our taxes from vassals and 10,800 levies from our vassals. As soon as we go feudal, 
that's going to drop pretty dramatically. So it's actually let a few days pass so that it evens out. So you can see our income did go down, actually not as much as I thought it would, but the levies went down by about three, little, little more than 3,000 troops. So if you're really on the cusp of being able to declare war or defend yourself from rebellions, going feudal could ruin you. So just make sure you have a bunch of money saved up. And then also when you switch from tribal to feudal, all that money you spent in your, your buildings is going to have to be redone. I, I don't know if it's RNG. I think they just give you random buildings, to be honest, but maybe it's not. But most of the time, you're going to have to redo all your buildings from scratch. So you come in here and you have to click this replace building and then you go pick through the ones that you want. We'll cover buildings in a, in a minute, but just be aware all the work that you spent doing your buildings is going to get erased. Now, that doesn't mean you don't want to do it. When you're tribal, you want to upgrade your buildings as fast as you can because that's going to allow you to expand as fast as you can like this. And then you can raid and you can do all that stuff. So that money and resources that you spent upgrading these buildings isn't wasted because it allows you to get all this extra land and, and save up all these resources. So super important, but hopefully that helps get you to feudal. Next, let's talk about economy. And we're going to cover buildings a little bit later, but just be aware there are some buildings that increase your economics. I don't think they're all that important, but usually farms and fields is probably the best one from the base buildings that you can get. It starts out as a 0.5 per month tax and it goes all the way up to 2.6. Gives you some other bonuses, but that one's pretty good. I usually in this campaign, I didn't want to take up the building slot with economic buildings as much. So what I did instead is I used my tribal CB where I could just declare war for far off lands and I worked my way down here to Africa and I took gold mines. These gold mines give you so much cash. So this is 10 times better than what that farm was giving. And it's at the same level of building. It's a level one. Now, if you get this thing up to level five, it's going to give you 14 gold. Every time you upgrade, it's just going to give you more and more money. That's pretty much how I solved my cash issues. I had three gold mines. So you can see right here, there's two right next to each other. There's another one up here. You can see the gold mines where they're located. If you go down here, you click this plus button and then you go to economy tab. It's going to show you where all the special buildings are. There's another one up here that I ended up taking soon after. This one gives you another plus five. Not all mines are created equal. So if you look at these ones up here, this one is a like a, I don't know, copper mine or whatever. It's a, it's a crappy one. It gives you plus two at level one, whereas this one gives you plus five at level one. There's another intermediate one that gives you plus three at level one. So again, you probably want to try and go to the gold mines if you can. Africa is pretty easy to conquer early on because they just don't have a whole lot of unity and their armies are not that strong. So getting down here and taking these three gold mines was actually really easy. And you can build these buildings even as tribal. You don't have to be feudal yet. To upgrade them to level two, three, and four, you definitely need to be feudal. But even just level one getting three, that's 15 gold per month. So really big, big difference getting those three. Now let's look at a save that I did when I maxed out every single building so you can kind of see like a, a top level overview of what everything looks like. Over here in the mainlands, these are the ones that I own from the very beginning of the campaign. The income from these are just, they're not that great. The highest one has 29. The troops are okay as well. They're not that great, but I didn't optimize for that. You can do different builds with your buildings. And what I mostly boosted up here was archer maintenance, archer damage, knight effectiveness, men at arms damage. So anybody that's stationed here is going to get a huge boost. And again, because the army's huge, we had a lot of people that needed these bonuses. So again, I pretty much did the same thing at, all, at each one. I was trying to build any building that would give me greater archer damage. Archer damage, archer toughness. There's a few things in here for the economy, like development growth and some holding tax. But for the most part, everything is centered around the archers. And then for the duchy building, you get to, if you go to the capital of each duchy, so for instance, the, du the capital of Munster is right here. This duchy building, I went with Grand Military Academy. So at level three, it actually gives you men at arms regiment plus three. So that's huge. We're already getting plus 16 from our accolades. We're getting plus from technologies, we're getting more from other buildings, we're getting it from this building, we're just stacking them on, you know, more and more stacking. This also gives more knights, which are really strong in 75 knight effectiveness, and of course reducing the maintenance cost. So just stacking the crap out of everything that we can get our hands on. Did the same thing up here, military academies, and then anything I could get my hands on. Now, if you look right here at the, the summary, the three holdings that I used to make the majority of my money were down here in Africa, these three gold mine provinces. 
So you can see they're making triple, sometimes very close to making four times as much as these other ones. So if you can specialize your land to where these are all military, the, up here in Ireland, these are all military buildings. I want them to boost up my military as much as they can. And then down here, everything down here is geared towards economy. Make as much money as you can. I don't care if they station people or if they have bonuses. It's all about making that money. So all maxed out, you can get up to 70, almost 75 gold for a single county. It's crazy. And then the last thing that's nice about these gold mines is they actually give you siege weapon effectiveness. So you can see our bombards, the bombards are all stationed down here because they get that plus 40% effectiveness. So now the siege time is incredibly fast because of that. So good money, good place to park your siege weapons as well. I do recommend trying to target something on the map. It doesn't have to be the gold mines if you just go to the economy tab. Just have a look around, see what's on there. There's some buildings that give decent income away, like this Grand Mosque gives you two gold per, per month. Some of these temples don't give a ton of money, but they give 500 levies, levies flat, which is really good in the early game. So there's there's some buildings that can be nice to take if you get it early enough. But yeah, if you follow this, you shouldn't have any issues with your economy. Your early game is supported by a lot of raiding, selling prisoners, things like that. And then the mid to late game is all about building up those gold mines and just having them spit out a ton of cash. Now, succession is a really complicated topic, so we're going to just scratch the surface and only cover the stuff that I did in this campaign. So one thing you can do if you have too many heirs and you want to get rid of one, you can send them off in their own party just by themselves into the enemy and have the enemy take a whack at them. If you're lucky, they'll get killed. Or you can give away land to the heirs below. So for example, if, if we have a primary heir that's supposed to inherit you know, a bunch of stuff, then you start having extra kids. The second heir is going to end up taking a bunch of your original land that you have. So for example, right now, we've got these two duchies over here with seven counties. But if he has a brother, he the brother is going to take half of this. He's going to take one of the duchies and all the counties within that duchy. So to counter that, we need to give the brother two duchies worth of land. Now the counties don't matter because you're trying to match the duchy title, not the counties. Doesn't matter. It's it's whatever is the second highest rank that you have is what your uh, heirs are gonna fight over. Not not the top rank. The top rank will always go to your primary heir. The second one below it is the one that that gets split. So this guy's dad was vying for land with this with this kid. So what I ended up doing is just conquering two duchies worth of land and giving it to him. And that took him out of the succession. Didn't have to worry about it. And then. This guy's dad ended up inheriting all the stuff that I originally wanted him to keep. So you can expand and conquer to avoid succession if you want. It's kind of risky because if you don't do it fast enough uh, or if you have a lot of kids, you have to do a ton of expansion very, very quickly. So you got to be careful with that. But what I recommend is just to not have too many kids. There's a couple ways you can do that. So first and foremost, one of my favorite ways to do it is to have an old wife. So right now I was trying to get a bunch of kids in this specific one, but generally what you want to do is you want to go in there and, and marry somebody that's old. So let's say we're trying to find a spouse for this kid. What you'd want to do is you'd want to go in and find somebody that's older. So you can sort by age, go from the top down. Usually 45 is the cutoff when they stop having kids. So 45, if you're trying to have more kids or at least one, 45 is too old. You probably want to go 40, 41, 42, somewhere in that range is probably a good bet. And then you can also, when you click on it and propose it, you can see what the chance of having children is. Medium, you probably have one or two kids. If you go up here and do like a 46 year old, it's low. She's 46, so she should not have kids, but she has a trait that gives her fertility a boost. So that's why she's uh, she's getting a little bit more chance to have kids. Somebody that's 45 without it, again, pretty low chance, probably not gonna happen. If you go with say like a like an 18 year old or whatever, let's say you go with an 18 year old, you've got a lot of child rearing years that you gotta deal with. And I talked about this in another section, but an easy, probably one of the easiest ways to do it is just not get married. Go the learning route, pick up these two perks. Restraint is the second one. That's the one you want. You can embrace celibacy and that'll drop your fertility to zero. So what you can do is you can get married, have some kids, turn the celibacy on, stop having kids. And then you can have a young wife, you can have an old wife, it doesn't really matter. You, you just, uh, you have your kids ready to go. And if you lose a kid or they get maimed or whatever, and you want to have a different one, you can just turn celibacy off and kind of toggle it as you see fit. That's a really good way to handle it.
And let's say you have enough kids and you don't want to have any more. The guaranteed way to do it is to come up here to the filter tab, go to fertility and put on infertile. So 84 years old, that's a no brainer. There's no way she's having kids, but she's also useless. So that's not going to work. But you can see some of these people are just really old. You can find somebody that's younger that has decent stats, but maybe has some issues like maybe they're infertile. So for example, this lady, she's 37. She should be able to have kids, but she's barren and she has lover's pox. So very low chance you might still Still have kids here it says low chance but it's pretty slim so that's a safe bet that's definitely one way you can limit the amount of errors that you're going to have now as you get into the mid game so for example right now currently this is mid game for sure we got what five kingdom titles if we have a bunch of kids all these kingdom titles are going to get split up it's not that big of a deal because we still retain the empire title so they would be our vassals still they wouldn't break off on their own but let's say we get up into the late game or the mid game where you have a lot of top tier titles like uh let's say if you don't have an empire yet and you have a bunch of kingdoms or if you have empire titles and you have more than one if you have more than one heir these are all going to get split anytime you have the same level of tier that's going to get split so for example let's say we have three empire titles and we have three kids each of those kids is going to get their own empire and on death, they're all going to become independent. So we would have to fight with them to, to get those back. It does not make sense to deal with that. It's better just to spend the renown and disinherit. So for example, this daughter has already been disinherited. This son has already been disinherited. I spent the renown and the prestige to do it. And now we just have one kid, a genius Herculean with divine blood. That's definitely the one you want to keep. So he's going to get all these titles upon uh, my death. And then as you get into the very late game and you're able to pass primogenitor, you don't have to disinherit anybody. However, I do recommend disinheriting. So if we look right here, we've got three kids, but we have primogenitor. So that means it's going to go to the eldest. And in this case, we have equal inheritance. So male and female can inherit equally. So our daughter's going to get it. She's got a couple kids that aren't too bad, but she's a mess. Irritable, reclusive, drunkard. She lost all the good traits. She's only got robust, doesn't have genius or anything. But if we look at our son, he's at least got quick and robust. And the other son is intelligent and robust. So in this case, it would make sense to disinherit. Even though there's no issues with succession, it makes sense to disinherit. So we'll go ahead and disinherit that one. It's going to go down to this guy. He's not very good either. So we can disinherit him. And it's going to pass right on to the good son. So now our youngest that has better traits. And he's younger. He's going to have more time to rule by the time we die. He's going to be the one taking over. So even when you're out of the woods, you don't have to worry about succession issues. It still makes sense to disinherit people just to set your kingdom up nicely. An extra couple of renown is, is not going to hurt you. As you can see here, we have 95,000. Probably spending 150 a couple times isn't going to really do much there. That pretty much sums it up for this campaign. I'm going to do a full in-depth guide on this soon. It is really complex. I need to do a lot of testing for it to show it off. But that should get you going just for the basics at least. Now, when it comes to personal items, there's going to be a lot of variants here. So one thing that I tried to focus on are items that gave Vassal limit, just because that's such a valuable resource to have in the late game. Vassal opinion was pretty good, too. In the early game, you probably want to pick up something a little different, like maybe some prestige or renown or piety gain, things that you're going to be low on. Obviously, in the mid to late stage, it's just irrelevant. So you want to take other things. Also, number of knights is really good to have. Knight effectiveness is half decent. And then the trinkets, it's kind of hard to find good trinkets. Most of them are just going to help you in the early game getting a little bit of prestige and renown. But most of them, I, I've gone through, I don't know, probably two to 3,000 items in this game, in this campaign. And I, these are the best ones that I could find. Like, they're just not that good. But the, these are pretty good, though. You're going to have most of your good items in the throne room. So let's take a look at the ones that I've got set up here. Starting with a throne. This throne is pretty good. It gives powerful vassal opinion plus 10. It also gives diplomacy per level of fame plus one. Those two are really good. Powerful vassal, obviously we want to keep our vassals happy so we don't have to deal with rebellions. And then diplomacy also helps with the relations. The more diplomacy you have in your main guy, the better uh, relations you're going to have. I also tried to get a lot of vassal limit increases. So you'll notice a lot of the wall armaments have either number of knights increase or vassal limit. So this is pl plus 14, plus 12, another plus 10. I think there's one on the floor that has, yeah, this one's got plus 10 vassal limit and plus one domain limit. This item is crazy. So if you can fight the Byzantines and get this from them, this is such a good item. Yeah, plus one domain limit is really, really good. And then the furniture, again, I was trying to go for learning lifestyle as well as learning points. 
so I could speed up the research time. So this item was pretty good, learning for level of fame. And then I really like these. So for this build, going a reformed Asatru and having almost nobody else on the map as Asatru, having face, faith hostility advantage is huge. So basically it's giving you a plus eight to your rolls just for having this one banner. Another plus six here, so that's plus 14. Without doing anything else, literally every fight we do is gonna be advantage plus 14. So it's, it's really easy to, to stack white people. And then I kept a lot of books. If you look at how many books I kept, there's a lot. So basically the idea here is if I need to get one or two perks in a certain tree, I would keep the books around to boost the lifestyle XP. So for example, I've got some intrigue, some learning, diplomacy. So pretty much all of them I've got so I can match them. If I need to get a couple perks, I throw the books on. And then when I switch to the other lifestyle, because I rarely go down one tree and stay there, I usually bounce around depending on what is needed. So it's good to have a nice selection of these things. That's The books are really the only one that I did that with. I wouldn't really spend too much time on this other stuff. Really just, for especially for this campaign, look for Vassal Limit, look for Faith Hostility Advantage, Domain Limit. Those are really all you need. Everything else here just kind of for Court Grandeur bonus. The, the bonuses are really inconsequential. One other thing is make sure as you're getting things, destroy anything that you can. So if you notice these green ones give either between 40 and 80. That's a lot of money, especially if you're, I, I like I said, I'm not even kidding you. I've gone through thousands of these items. So imagine how much gold that adds up to. Now in the late game, not a big deal, but in the early and mid game, it's really a lot of money. It adds up very quickly. So make sure you pick up that money. It's just going to degrade and, and get destroyed anyways. So make that money. Now, when it comes to counselor tasks, I usually like to start with the wife. And I know I touched on this earlier, but you should really be using your wife to supplement whatever it is that you're short on. So, for example, right now, if I'm trying to unlock a bunch of research techs, the best thing you can do is get somebody with high patronage. Now, you don't want to go below your domain limits, so you want to make sure that's still covered. But find somebody with a high learning, switch it to that. In the early game, you want to have somebody that's going to help you a lot with domain limit because having an extra one or two fiefs or uh, counties in your name is, is going to make a massive difference. So make sure you do that. I rarely use assist ruler. The only time I'll ever use assist ruler is if the bonus is the same. Like if I go ma manage domain and it gives me plus one and I put it on assist ruler and it's still plus one, then I'll leave it on assist ruler so I can pick up the other ones. I almost never use assist ruler. I always toggle between their strengths and I will make sure I marry based on what I need. So like I said, if you need to divorce somebody, you get married because you need something. And then let's say you need extra fiefs but then you're going down Sturt Tree and you unlock this one. You don't need the wife anymore. Dump her, get rid of her. Find somebody that's got what you need. In this case, I needed a lot of learning. So she's she helped a lot with unlocking research. Really important with that. So wife's probably the most important one on this list, but these other ones are, are fairly important as well. I generally use Convert Faith. I help my vassals convert their lands simply because if they if you don't help them they're going to keep getting rebellions and sometimes you may have to deal with it yourself if it's if it's one of the big ones so help them convert your lands or their lands and in the early game you probably want to leave it on religious relations just so that you can pick up the extra piety if you need it so you can de declare wars but generally you want to have it on uh, convert faith every time it's off cooldown and you'll you'll never ever have to use fabricate claim on county with this campaign i never fabricated a single claim everything was is already there with other cbs looking at chancellors i really only used foreign affairs in the early game and then once i started getting a large number of vassals i left it on domestic affairs forever so foreign affairs basically gives you higher prestige and you're going to need a ton of prestige as a tribal. So definitely that's the best way to go. Independent ruler opinion. Who gives a flip? Like if people outside of your kingdom like you or not, they're going to hate you anyways because you're going to change religion. So this is useless. Once you don't need to worry about prestige anymore and you have vassals to worry about, always leave it on domestic affairs. This is going to give you a huge boost to relations. So plus 13 or plus 14 in this case, once everything's up to the max. I've never used any great title, seems kind of useless. And then bestow favor is okay if you have one specific vassal that needs a huge amount of relations boost. So for example, this one can go all the way up to 100, whereas this one stops at 14, but works for everybody. So this can be good if you have one specific person that needs help. Chancellor is really easy. Stuart, I pretty much leave it on increased development almost the whole game other than promoting culture. 
Now you don't need to promote culture for your vassals. I started to do that down here and I thought maybe that would help them kind of convert lands themselves, but it really doesn't make a difference. So what I would do is just convert your own lands. I also converted my lands down here because this is where I had the gold mines. And then after that, don't, don't bother. It just takes forever and there's no benefit because all the cultures that you hybridize with, they like you anyways. So you're 100% acceptance. You don't need it. Uh, so yeah, pretty much leave it on increased development. I guess if you're really hurting for money, you can leave it on collect taxes. So increased development is good. And generally with increased development, you want to put it on the one that's going to be collect the most taxes. And in this case, remember I mentioned all the money is being made down here. So I left the development on here for a while, uh, quite a while. 43, 56, 50. So most of the de developments down here. And you can compare that to some of the best development in the game. 87, that's actually really high. That's a bad example. <laughs> Rome 68. So it's not too far off from Rome, actually. And then, of course, in the early, early game, when you need to hybridize, you need to promote culture so that you can get up to that 40%. That's the Stuart Marshall. Pretty much just leave it on train commanders almost the entire game. I use increased control in the very beginning when you need to get your control up. That one's pretty obvious. But after that, I really relied heavily on my men at arms. And so this one boosts them up, in this case, by 29%, which is a lot. So I, I would recommend leaving it on that. If you're struggling with money, you can use Organized Army. That'll decrease the maintenance by 33%, which is quite a lot. But again, money shouldn't really be an issue. And having army strength makes the war shorter. So I generally go with that. Spymaster, leave it on disrupt schemes. If you're trying to assassinate somebody, you can switch it to support schemes. Do not bother with fine secrets. It's a total waste of time, in my opinion. So just leave it on disrupt. That one's pretty easy. And that's pretty much the counselor tasks. When it comes to research, you should definitely be prioritizing certain things over others. For example, my absolute favorite is going to be the siege equipment. In tribal, onager, when you get to early medieval, mangonels is really important, trebuchet and bombards. This is just going to make your life so much easier. You're going to conquer lands faster, take less attrition. You don't need as many troops because the wars are over so fast. Really, really nice to have. The second would be the mustering grounds, and it's the same for each each year that you or each uh, era that you move on. It just increases the size. So, for example, in the early stages, it's two and one. Here, it's three and one, four and one, ends at five and one. So basically, it increases the size of your regiments, and it gives you an extra regiment each time. So that one's really important to get pretty early on as well. Another thing you should be focusing on are the ones that give you domain limit. So in tribal, Gavelkind gives you one. And then also in the late medieval, court official gives you plus one as well. So there's plus two domain from the text. Those you should be targeting as soon as you can. And then from there, it really depends on what you need. So if you're struggling with money, you probably want to go with economic buildings first. The barracks. And again, like I said, every era is going to be the exact same. So like if you look at tribal, it's right here. Military buildings, military buildings military buildings. They give a little bit more bonus beside that, but pretty much it's, this, it's in the same location. So when I say barracks, I mean anything that's in this slot, depending on no matter what era it's at. And then same thing with crop rotation, coinage. Uh, I think they moved this one. Yeah, man manorialism. If you need money, those are good. Also, any of the ones I, I would say pretty quickly on, you should be getting the building slots as well. So you want to get good siege, bigger army, either economy or, or military buildings if you need it. If not, definitely take the building slots and then everything else can come after that. It doesn't really make that big of a difference. Most of these are just kind of nice to have, but not really necessary to have. So I would I would leave it at that. And again, it should be about the same all the way up to the very end. And then one other thing, I actually wish I knew this while I was doing the campaign, but unfortunately, I only figured it out until I started making this video. So these texts down here, Again, it's going to be the same in every era. There's at the very bottom, there's going to be cultural and regional. So if you look down here, there's some of these are actually pretty good. So like long ships gives you embarkation cost minus 75% and naval speed plus 25. That's not too bad. These other ones just give you special units. They're not that great. This one is really good for, for this specific build that we were doing. Cassis Belli cost the piety cost minus 10% and we're literally only doing holy wars for kingdoms. So it's all piety cost. This would have come in really handy, but notice that you don't have access to it until you have nine counties in Iberia that are still of, of your culture, basically. So you do have to do some work to get these to, to be active. And then if you look at under high medieval, seniorism is pretty good. Domain taxes plus 5%. If you're struggling with money, that's really good. And then peerage can be pretty good because you get vassal tax. If you look at how much money we're making from vassals, 
it's like five times what we're making with our own domain. So that would boost your income a lot. And courtly vassal opinion, pretty good. And then finally, Virgit. I have no clue how to pronounce that. This one gives you quite a few bonuses, including development growth. So that's not bad. Deck on Unity, plus five same faith opinion. We are already stacking a bunch of these from the other stuff we we're doing. So getting this would be really nice to have. You can actually do this. I have a save where I specifically did it. So what you need to do is you need to go, if you want to have one of these texts, like you find one specifically that you like, for in this case, in this instance, I think it's probably Weirdikes because uh, it's in Holland. So I think they, uh, this has to do with the dikes. So if you notice down here, we need, it says we need two counties in Netherlands to be Irish. So if you click on it, it'll have a little highlight for you. So any two of these need to be converted. Doesn't matter which ones, just that two of them are. I already spent time converting this one, and this one is right about to convert. So you'll notice that it is still grayed out. As soon as this finishes, so 17 days, as soon as this finishes, we'll see it open up, and then you have to, you still have to research it, but it opens it up. All right, there we go. So it opened it up. Now you, you still, like I said, you still have to research it, but I mean, come on, seven years, who cares? Any of these you can do. So for example, if I wanted to open up this same faith opinion, this would be really, really good to have for this build. So Deccan India. So any, any seven cultures in here. Now it's going to take some time. So what I would recommend doing is open up your convert culture. You can see if you hover over down here in the bottom, it says we'll complete in five years. Look for ones that are short. So for example, this one's only four years, five years, five years, seven years. So it looks like five years is probably gonna be the average. We can get away with one four year and then a bunch of five years. So at seven, that's gonna be about 34 years total before we can research it. That's not bad. So 34 years, you get a free tech. Well, 34 years plus the time to research it, but still. And imagine if you did that with some of these, like Woots Steel. This one gives everybody in your, in your culture plus one prowess for the entire game. That would be pretty nice to have. Again, having the long ships, embarkation cost. When you get into the late game, it costs you, you know, five, 600 gold to get your army across the ocean. It's really expensive. So that can save you a bit of a cash. This one is also really good. Although 11 counties in Arabia would be kind of tough, but minus 15% men at arm costs. That is really good if you're struggling to pay for your army. So like I said, don't count these out. Just what I would do is look ahead maybe a hundred years before you're actually going to get there. So for example, in the early game, you're not going to get to early medieval until maybe a hundred years or so, something like that. I don't recall exactly, but yeah, it's going to take you a little while. So if you know that's going to be the case and you know you need to have at least nine counties down here, just start picking off little ones and converting them over time. If it's going to take you seven or eight years to convert each one, just start doing it little by little. And then by the time you roll around, you can research it. It's it's definitely worth doing, in my opinion. So again, I didn't use it in my campaign, but I thought that was really cool. And I just figured it out. I wish I had figured it out before I did it, though. If you want to see the actual campaign this guide came from, click this video right here. A huge shout out to the YouTube members and Patreon supporters who help keep this channel afloat. I appreciate you.